concept of pressure, how it's measured, concept of temperature and how it's measured, and thermal equilibrium. Um, but the calculations are going to mostly involve the gas law. Right, question number one then. Uh, a mass of oxygen occupies 0 0.2 meters cubed. At atmospheric pressure and at five degrees centigrade. Determine its volume if its pressure is increased to 180 kilopascals, that's a thousand pascals. while its temperature is changed to 30 degrees centigrade. So we're going to find its volume. Um, by the way, a general procedure, oh, where, where am I? A general procedure for calculation, I think I may have mentioned this, but when you want to calculate something, especially when it's something that you're not sure, well, not especially always, but it's, ex it's especially helpful when you're not sure of the method to solve something. Draw your diagram. The drawing the diagram, even a simple one, helps you to picture the problem. Then you write your data down. Sometimes you don't know where, where you know, what method to use. Um, so if you write your data down and then write the formulas that contain the data and contain the thing you're trying to find. Sometimes, sometimes you only need one formula. Sometimes you may, in more complicated problems, you may need two or more formulae. This thing keeps telling me I'm presenting. It's kind of irritating. I mean, it doesn't disappear. Uh, so as a general strategy for solving problems then, draw a diagram, write your data, and then write the formulas which contain the data and the things that you're trying to find. That normally gives you an idea as to how to proceed. And you can probably guess, you've got P1, V1, T1, the initial uh, state of the gas. I'll say more about states at a later time, uh, but for an ideal gas, uh, the state of the gas can be defined by the pressure, volume, and temperature. Now, because of the gas law, because we have the gas law, and because, and if we have, we if we know the amount, then if we know P and we know V, then it determines T. So we only need to know two thermodynamic variables to determine the state of the gas. P, V, and T uh, are called thermodynamic variables, and they're connected. So we, not, we only need to know two of them to find the other one. Anyway, the state is defined by P1, V1, and T1, and P2, V2, and T2. And we know the formula that connects these together is going to be this thing. Um, the gas law in this form. Anyway, all I'm going to do is just to basically use this equation. I'm trying to find V2, so make V2 the subject and push my numbers in. Uh, do I need to do that on the whiteboard, or is it easy? Is this, do I need to do one example on the whiteboard, or is this fairly easy? You can just proceed, sir. It's straightforward, isn't it? <coughs> this question is essentially the same. Uh, let me read it. Uh, the gauge pressure in a car tire is 305 kilopascals when its temperature is 15 degrees centigrade. After running at high speed, the tire is heated up and its pressure is 360 kilopascals. What is the new temperature of the air in the tire? There are two things in this problem. One, we're given the gauge pressure. But in these formulas, you have to use the complete pressure, not the gauge pressure. So we have to add the atmospheric pressure to the gauge pressure. Because that, that, that would be the correct pressure in the tire. Um, so when you're given gauge pressures, you must convert to uh, 
the pressure, the the total pressure, which includes the pressure of the atmosphere. So that's one difference uh, to keep in mind. So we've done that here. This is the gauge pressure that we're given. Again, I prefer to go to to, to base SI units pascals. Um, atmospheric pressure in pascals is 1.013 times 10 to the 5 pascals. So add these two together. So I get my P1. Again, in this formula, it is crucial you convert to Kelvin. If you use degrees in these formulas, uh, you'll get the wrong answer. So you have to use degrees Kelvin. Um, when I finish this example, I'll show you when you can use either one. Anyway, this is my P1. I'm given also my gauge pressure uh, after the tire is heated. So my total pressure is this one. I don't know T2. In this problem though, the tire doesn't really expand by very much. So we can neglect the change in the volume. You know in your car tire, if it's going to expand a lot, you won't be able to drive the car very well. So the tire itself is quite thick. And so the amount of, it does expand a bit of course. Rubber, rubber does expand a little bit. Um, but rubber is an insulator, so it doesn't expand by a lot. Uh, even the air pushing it out, it won't be enough to change the volume by much. So we can assume that V1 is equal to V2. And in which case, in this formula, my V1 and V2 cancel. I make T to the subject, push my numbers in, and we've got the answer. Uh, again, I think it's very straightforward. I just want to show you something on the whiteboard. Let me increase. As I say, in, in generally speaking, in, in formulas, you must use degrees Kelvin. The exception is when you have differences in temperature. Wherever you have a differences in temperature, it makes no difference whether you use Uh, degrees Kel degrees centigrade or degrees Kelvin and the reason is of course as we as we have said the actual size of one degree centigrade is equal to one degree Kelvin the magnitude of the of the uh, of the degrees are the same what differs is their starting point so for example if you have a problem and you've got th equals let's say 50 degrees centigrade uh, minus sorry and then you have TC equals 20 degrees centigrade. Then TH minus TC is 50 minus 20. What's that? 30. Uh, if I convert this to degrees Kelvin, I can't do this in my head very well. It's 273. Let me see if we can do it. 0.2 plus 50. Uh, what's that going to be? If this is 270, this will be 220. Is my, mass, my mental arithmetic correct? Uh, and if it's 20, this will be 293.2. If I subtract these two things, sorry about this. Let me, let me do that properly. Let me rewrite this again a, a bit later. Just check my mental arithmetic. Now TC will be 273.2 plus 20 degrees. This will be 293.2. Uh, now my TH minus TC 50 minus 20 equals 30 degrees centigrade. T 
TH minus TC in degrees Kelvin. is 323.2 minus 293.2, which is still 30 degrees. So only when you have temperature differences, I hope my, my mental arithmetic is correct, only when you have temperature differences can you interchange between degrees centigrade or degrees Celsius and degrees Kelvin. And notice when you write Kelvin, you don't put the little circle there. Uh, just to emphasize that point. Um, all of these are very simple examples. Question three then. An ideal gas has a volume of exactly one liter at one atmosphere and 20 degrees. How many atmos atmospheres of pressure must be applied for the gas to be compressed uh, to 0.5 liters? to half of its volume, in other words. So, uh, so we have a... We have an ideal gas then at one liter and one atmosphere at 20 degrees. We want to know, we want to compress this to half of its volume to 0.5 liters uh, and at this new temperature, and we need to know what pressure will do that. You can see it's the same thing as before. We just have to convert. Uh, one meter is a thousand cubic centimeters. One centimeter is 10 to the minus two meters. Cube all of that. We have 10 to the minus six multiplied by 10 to the three gives me 10 to the minus three uh, meters cubed. So one liter then is 1000 cubic centimeters or 10 to the minus three meters cubed. Again, I like converting to base, base SI units. Um, one atmosphere in Pascals. Okay, and then again, I'm just converting to base SI units. And again, notice that I'm converting from degrees Celsius to degrees Kelvin, and I must do that in this formula. Well, it's just a question of making P to the subject and pushing my numbers in. So again, it's quite straightforward. Huh? Any questions on that? I go on. Now I'm assuming all this is easy for you. Uh, this one is a little bit needs a little bit more thinking, but it's not not too much. Uh, a fish emits a two millimeter cubed bubble at a depth of 50 meters in a lake. So we have our little fish at a depth of 15 meters, and it, it emits a little bubble. Now, the state of the air in that bubble is given by V1, T1, and P1. This thing rises uh, to the top, the temperature changes, the pressure of the water changes, so the volume, so the pressure on the bubble here is going to be different to the, to the pressure here. And so the bubble expands, because the, you can guess that the P2 is going to be less than P1. Uh, so with less pressure, uh, the volume uh, is likely to expand. Unless, of course, it gets very cold, but we don't know that. Most likely it's going to get bigger. Either way, the calculation will tell us. Um, all right, so let's gather our information together. I'll need the acceleration due to gravity. Now we need the density of the, of the water. This is one gram per cubic centimeter. And I, again, I've done my conversion. I hope that everyone knows how to do these conversions very well. Otherwise, if, if you're not sure, ask me to do it on the whiteboard. Uh, if I don't hear anything, I'll assume that everyone is finding it easy. So my density of water in is 10 to the 3 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, the depth I'm given in the question, 15 meters, and my atmospheric pressure in Pascals. 
I want to convert the volume to meters cubed. Uh, one millimeter is 10 to the minus three meters. Cube all of that. So it's two times 10 to the minus nine meters cubed. Now, we want, first of all, the pressure at this depth. So my pressure at uh, 15 meters is given by this. It's my formula, a normal formula for the pressure at a certain depth of a fluid. Rho, the density, times gravity, times the depth. But the pressure P1 inside the bubble, you also have to add, remember Pascal's principle? The, the atmosphere is acting on the surface of the lake with atmospheric pressure. And maybe I can even draw that for you. So we have a pressure from the atmosphere, atmospheric, which is given by this thing. By Pascal's principle, this pressure is transmitted at every point in the fluid. So down here then, we have the pressure uh, due to the depth plus the pressure due to the atmosphere. And that gives me P1. And then you can guess that at the surface, P2 is just going to be atmospheric pressure. Uh, so I know the pressures. What have I got to find? Find the volume of the bubble as it reaches the surface. Oh, we're assuming that actually in this thing that temperature doesn't change. I didn't notice that. So my T1 and T2 are the same. Have I written that down somewhere? Yes, here. So T2 is equal to T1. Um, well, I've, I've jumped a bit. Maybe I, I'll write this formula down. I've used P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. Since the temperatures are the same, I can multiply both sides by the temperature. T1 equals T2. So I get P2 V2. Um, anyway, once I get to that, it's just a question of pushing the numbers in. I make V2 the subject, and so my volume, as you can see, it expands from 2 millimeters to about 4.9, almost 5 millimeters cubed. <coughs> uh, any questions on that? Straightforward? Uh, I don't hear any questions, so I'll assume it's easy. Uh, we come to the last example. This one will need a little bit more uh, thinking. Question number five. A tank contains... A tank contains 18 kilograms of nitrogen. Notice that the two indicates that the nitrogen is made up of two atoms. So this is a molecule of nitrogen. Uh, of nitrogen gas at a pressure of 4.5 atmospheres. How much H2, that's hydrogen. Again, hydrogen is diatomic, meaning that it, it consists of two atoms. A lot of gases actually are not monatomic. Monatomic means they contain one atom in the molecule. Not many gases are just one atom. Um, quite a few gases are, you know, a, a mole are, are in molecular form containing two or more atoms. Ozone, for example, contains three oxygen atoms. Um, how much hydrogen gas at 3.5 atmospheres and the same temperature with the same tank contain. So we have a tank then that contains 18 kg of nitrogen gas at a particular pressure. We want to know how much weight of hydrogen does the same volume, the same tank contain at a slightly different temperature, uh, slightly different pressure, but the same temperature. So this is what we've got to do. Uh, so the state of the nitrogen is given by PNT 
TN and VN. The state of the hydrogen gas is given by pH, TH, and VH. We're told that the temperature is the same, but we also told that the volumes are the same. So in this case, we have uh, these two things are equal. Now my data. First of all, it's the mass of nitrogen. It's the mass of hydrogen that I'm trying to find. Um, to find these quantities, we need to uh, go to the molecular mass. Um, I think I'm going to show you how to look this up. Um, let me just get these numbers on my other side. And then I'm going to show you how to look these numbers up from... I think you, I think you have so way, all of you. In any case, from book of tables, they're pretty similar in, in different textbooks. But let's have a look how we find the molecular weight. So let me go to so weight. Now we want the molecular weight of nitrogen uh, and of hydrogen. Uh, let me start with the nitrogen first. Now you can see from here, let me make sure you, you probably know this, but let me just make sure we do, we do understand this. We'll go to the whiteboard again. Uh, I think you know the structure of an atom. This picture is not completely accurate. When eventually you do quantum mechanics, those of you that will do physics, uh, quantum mechanics is a, one of the modern fundamental uh, topics of physics or areas of physics. Started in 1900, uh, with uh, black body radiation and emerged into one of a highly developed theory and differs from classical mechanics. And many of the, the electronic devices that you use today uh, are based on quantum mechanical effects, Joseph's and junctions and the such. So the picture I'm going to give you is Bohr's 1913 uh, model of the atom. Uh, it is not completely correct because the picture of, of particles on quantum mechanics, there is a duality there. Um, but for now, let's just stick to the simple uh, Bohr model of the atom. In the Bohr model, we have protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And then we have electrons that whiz around Again, this picture is, needs to be modified when you take quantum mechanics into account. But let's take, keep a simple picture of the atom. So if I have two, uh, two protons and I, I need two electrons, the exact state doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, And so when we write the mass number, by the way, uh, A is the mass number, is a total number of protons and neutrons. So it's the number of protons and the number of neutrons. P will be the number of protons, N is the number of neutrons. So if I have some kind of chemical, and let me just call it, let me just call this letter Y. And you normally write the uh, mass number there and the number of protons there and the number of neutrons. So the chemical names are normally written like this, the mass number, number of protons, and number of neutrons. Uh, so for the same substance, you can have the same number of protons, but sometimes the number of neutrons can vary. Now the variation of the number of neutrons, uh, you call an is isotopes. So an isotope is, a sub, is a, an atom of the same type, but with different numbers of neutrons. 
<coughs> so here, for example, we've got nitrogen has seven protons. Uh, seven protons, but its neutrons vary. Uh, this is the mass number. So seven minus 12 is that. This has five neutrons, six neutrons, and this one here has seven neutrons, seven protons and seven neutrons to get a mass number of 14. If you look at the table, there's a percentage of abundances because these isotopes occur in mixtures. Uh, some of these isotopes live for a very, very short time. So in, in normal air, for example, you don't get, you don't get many of these uh, short-lived things. For example, in nitrogen, this thing lasts for 0 0.0110 seconds, 0 0.01 of a second. This isotope lasts for about, this is the half-life, about nine minutes, seven, uh, seven seconds, four seconds. So you can see these things you can neglect. The most common one is nitrogen, uh, seven protons, seven neutrons, mass number 14. And this is its, its atomic mass. Since the nitrogen molecule has two atoms, we multiply this by two. Um, you can see to four significant figures, this is 14. So when we do calculations, uh, we normally calculate to four significant figures. So my mass, my molecular mass for nitrogen is 28. And remember what we said? That uh, molecular masses are actually... Sir, I said what about the significant figures? Go ahead. Go on. What about the significant figures? You said what? I can't really hear you. Say that again. Oh, you talked of uh, the significant figures that we should get. So uh, I wanted you to repeat maybe how much you said. Sorry about that. A train went by. Can you just speak a bit more loud so I can, and slowly so I can hear you? What do you want me to repeat? Uh, on the significant figures that we should uh, get from there. Oh, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. When we come to the calculation, I'll, I'll repeat about significant figures. Um, but, but basically what I'm saying, when you're looking at these tables, it's sufficient for you to go to four. Quite often, actually, in your test or exams, they even do less significant figures. But for me, I like to calculate to four. So just, just take the first four significant figures when you're looking up atomic masses. Uh, I'll explain more in the calculation. Anyway, there are two atoms in nitrogen, so the molecular mass is going to be 2 times 14, so it's going to be 28. When we go to hydrogen, if we look, again, the most common one is, uh, has a mass number 1. In other words, it's one proton and no neutrons. You can see from here the percentage abundance, 99.988% of hydrogen is of the form of uh, one proton and no neutrons. So the, and now, but the hydrogen molecule has two, uh, two atoms, so its molecular mass of hydrogen will be two times this. There's a 0, 0, 007 there, so it's gonna be 2.014. Um, again, just to repeat, so that you're aware of the difference between chemical atomic masses and atomic masses. Atomic masses, this was, I think, uh, adopted in 1961, where they used carbon, one-twelfth the mass of a carbon atom, um, as the standard. In other words, these, what, what are called masses, are just comparisons with the one-twelfth of the carbon atom. So you can imagine that carbon, and it's the carbon-12, the, the isotope with six protons and six neutrons. So it's carbon-12, where is carbon-12? Six, six protons. So when you look at carbon-12, it has, has an, a, an atomic mass of exactly 12. This is by definition, because all other atomic masses are by comparison to the carbon atom. One twelve, to be precise, is compared to one twelfth the mass of a carbon atom. 
these chemical masses, as I was saying yesterday, the reason there's a slight difference, because if you look at carbon-12 on the chemical scale, it's got a slightly different number. It's not exactly 12. This is because when chemists, chemists actually used to use oxygen as the comparison atom. Um, but when they were, and they were determining uh, atomic masses by chemical methods, and they were using mixtures of oxygen isotopes. Uh, and if you look at oxygen isotopes, we have the most common one. Let me call this 16 to be to keep it simple. The most common one is this one. And then we've got small percentages of other isotopes. These short-lived things can be completely neglected. So these three, so when chemists were doing finding masses by comparing to the hydrogen atom, they were using this mixture and they were giving it the number 16 and then comparing all other atoms to the oxygen atom. So this is why you get this difference, because they were not comparing with pure oxygen. Instead of, instead of comparing with one isotope of oxygen, they were comparing it with three. And they were giving the three isotopes the same number. This is why you get these variations between chemical and uh, the atomic masses that physicists use. And this is the table that we're going to use, not this one. Those of you in chemistry, uh, well, in, your chemists may be using this, this scale, I'm not sure. Okay, I've gone into a bit of detail on that to make sure you understand it. Um, where is my, my notes? All right, so this is how we get molecular masses from the tables then. Um, for nitrogen, it's 28. Uh, and again, in many calculations, we normally neglect the small uh, decimal bits. So for the molecular mass of hydrogen, it's two. Uh, two. It's just two. Um, what I've written here, the molecular mass actually is just a number. Um, but when you want to express it in terms of moles, uh, you can write it as, so this is basically one mole of a substance. So this is kilograms uh, per kilomole. How can I say this? Um, basically, when uh, doing these calculations, we convert from molecular masses as found in the table, we convert it into moles. And a mole is the molecular weight expressed uh, in grams. And you can convert that from um, grams per mole to kilograms per kilomole. So what we're really doing here is expressing the molecular mass uh, in terms of grams and converting to kilograms. So, what else do I need? All right, I think we have enough information there. We've got my molecular mass expressed in grams and converted to kilograms. Uh, this is the information that I had before. Okay, this is just my data that we, we have. Uh, now I want to know the number of moles. Uh, this is the mass. Yes. Of... Hmm? Excuse yes. me. Carry on, yes. Um, on, question, on question two, we're adding the pressures. Now, why are we multiplying? Uh, what have I, where, where am I looking? Right there. What, this one here? Yeah, what I'm doing here yes. is... I'm, yeah, what I'm doing, I'm converting from at atmospheres to pascals. Okay. So this is just a conversion factor. As if you know, if I, just to be very, some, make sure you, to be very clear, what I'm doing is I'm using one atmosphere. Remember the units of uh, pressure can be measured in atmospheres or 
the SI unit, the basic, it's a derived unit actually, but the SI unit for pressure is the Pascal, which is Newtons per meter squared, and it's 1.013 times 10 to the 5 Pascals. Uh, <clears throat> right, so this is just a conversion factor. Now, what we need to do to use uh, to use my formulas, I need to know the number of moles. So to find the number of moles, remember one mole is the molecular weight expressed in grams. Uh, and essentially what I've done here is I've taken the, as I was saying, I've taken the molecular mass and expressed it in terms of grams. I've converted to kilograms. Does that make sense? Maybe if I write this, just to make sure we know. One mole of a substance is the, depends if, if it's made up of molecules or atoms. If it's atoms, if it's one atom, then it's a, uh, one mole is the atomic mass expressed in grams. If it's a substance with, uh, with two atoms or three atoms in a molecule, then it's its molecular mass expressed in grams. So one mole then, in general, when I say molecular, read atomic for those, for those gases con consisting of one atom only. So one mole then is the molecular mass, the thing we look in the table, which has no units, is the molecular mass expressed in grams. What I've actually written here, the molecular mass itself actually doesn't have any units. So what I've written here is what one mole is equal to. So strictly speaking, this is one mole. But I'm going to use the, the language of molecular mass loosely. So I'm going to say molecular mass is equal to this and express it in terms of um, the, the weight of uh, one gram, uh, one mole, and the weight in terms of grams, and then convert. So just to be clear, I'm using this a bit loosely here. Um, but what we want is the is one mole of a substance. Now, if I know the mass of one mole of a substance, and this is the actual mass, so if I divide the mass by the num by the mass of one mole, then I get the number of moles. Now, it's important that you understand this equation because this will, in thermodynamics you'll be using this a lot. So this then is essentially the mass of one mole of a substance, the molecular mass expressed in grams, and then converted to kilograms. And this is the actual mass in kilograms. You could do these calculations. If you use the grams here and grams there, you would still get the same number of moles. So you can actually, uh, you, although you can do this, if you, if you, Stick to base SI units, it's a bit more work, but I think it's easier to understand. But it's up to you, depending on how well you understand things. But you'll get the same answer if you use grams instead of kilograms. All right, so this is the number of moles of nitrogen. Uh, for the number of moles of hydrogen, I take the mass of one mole of a substance, divided and divide into the actual mass, and this gives me the number of moles of hydrogen. Now, once I know the number of moles, I can use my gas law uh, to find, well, once I know this, I can use my gas law. So let me apply the gas law to the nitrogen first. Um, I've got rid of the subscripts because the volumes are the same and the temperatures are the same. So basically, I've used this. I don't need the subscripts because uh, they have the same value. So in my gas law, then, I have this for nitrogen, I have this for hydrogen. If I make V over RT the subject in this formula, V over RT the subject in this formula, you can see that these two things, are the, the left-hand sides are the same, so that I can equate one and two. Now if I equate, sorry, not two and three, so if I equate two and three, I now can find the number of moles of hydrogen. 
Remember in this formula here, I don't yet know the mass of hydrogen. So I know the, the mass of one mole of hydrogen, which is this, but I don't yet know this mass. So when I equate these two things, I can calculate the number of moles of hydrogen. So pushing my numbers in, uh, I might not not pushing my numbers in yet. Before I, from this formula, I need to substitute for NH. So where have I got? Uh, so NH is this thing. So let me substitute this for NH. So I get, I think I've, uh, I need to put another step in for you maybe. Let me add one more step in, in this thing. We had NH was equal to MH divided by the molecular, the weight of one mole of the hydrogen. So I had this. So let me substitute this into this equation. This is the pressure of, nit of uh, hydrogen, pressure of nitrogen. Uh, so what I've done from here, I've just uh, made MH the subject, substituted this into here, made MH the subject, so I've got this. And then when I push my numbers in, I've got my mass of hydrogen. And it turns out to three significant figures. I've yeah, what the young man was asking me, um, to be clear about significant figures, um, in the examples that I'm giving you, I'm not strictly doing what we ought to do. Um, strictly speaking, what this question is indicating is that when you write your answer, you write your answer to the least accurate of the data in the question. Now, this is given to three significant figures. That's why they put the zero there. But this is only 18 kilograms, so this is only two significant figures. So strictly speaking, when I give the answer, we should uh, give the answer to two significant figures, to the least accurate of data in the question. So when you're doing your test and your, and your exams, uh, you ought to do that. Look at the least accurate data and give your answer to that number of significant figures. When you calculate, always calculate one more significant figure than you're going to give your answer to. Otherwise, you'll propagate errors, too many errors. So calculate one more significant figure than the answer you're going to give. Now, what I'm doing in all the examples I'm going to give you, and even my solutions to the um, tutorial questions, I, I ignore the accuracy of this data, and I, and I like calculating to four significant figures, and giving my answer to three. The reason I like doing that, uh, it shows it shows up errors a little bit more a little bit more clearly when when your numbers differ too much. Um, if you round off too much, sometimes it, I kind of think it hides errors a bit. Uh, so this is why I like to do it this way. Uh, but keep in mind the correct way of doing it. Um, does that answer your question about significant figures that you were asking me before? Anyway, in this particular case, we've got, I've been calculating to four significant figures, and then I've got to round off. Now, when I round off here, uh, this one becomes 10, so it's 0 carry the 1, this becomes 10, 0 carry the 1, then this becomes 10 and 0 carry the 1, so I end up with 1 to 3 significant figures. Uh, any questions on that? Excuse me, sir. Go ahead. Uh, why did we have to convert the pressure from atmosphere to Pascal? As I as I say, you don't always have to, but 
you can confuse yourself with the units at the end of the calculation. The answer is you don't absolutely have to convert. You can stay, you can use atmospheres, but you have to be careful. I just think it's easier to use base SI. If you use base SI units, your units will come out correctly at the end. If you're going to start mixing units, you have to be careful how you interpret your answer. Do you see what I mean? You're going to have to do dimensional analysis, in other words, so that you can put your answer in terms of the right units. So the reason I convert, sometimes you have to convert. Like I was saying with temperature, when I use the gas law uh, using temperature, I, I absolutely have to convert to degrees Kelvin. Otherwise, you'll get the wrong answers. Except when you're talking of temperature differences. That is the exception. When you're using pressures, and even with volumes, you can use liters or you can use meters cubed or you can use centimeters. And with pressure, you can use atmospheres or you can use pascals or kilopascals, whatever. But if you don't use base SI units, you're going to have to be careful to express your answer in the correct units. So I don't know, how do you, how do you feel? Is base SI units easier? Um, it's up to you. My advice is convert to base SI units to be safe. Uh, if, you, if you know units very well and you're comfortable to the dimensional analysis, uh, then you can use atmospheres. Does that answer your question? Yes, I yes, of course. Um, okay, time is up. We're finished in a good place. We are ready. <coughs> um, I don't know quite what quizzes you're going to end up with. You, you maybe let me know which quizzes are coming up, because the next topic is um, thermal properties. Um, followed by thermodynamics. Uh, now, I think your the tutorial question that I've got uh, has combined thermal properties and thermodynamics. So it's quite a big subject before we get to the actual examples. Sorry, sir. So, sir. Yeah? Uh, Carry on. The next topic is what? Thermal properties. Okay, sir. Thank you. Let's and let me just let me just check on the um, uh, let me just check on you're gonna uh, I don't want to keep you I don't want to delay you from your other lecture excuse uh, me sir yes um, I wasn't quite sure on okay I wasn't quite clear on the Archimedes principle as well as the buoyant forces I'd like to know how to calculate and how to come up with the formula in terms of the total, totally, or rather complete sub, submission as well as the partial. Right. Um, time is up now. Can you make sure you attend Friday's tutorial? And then you can maybe pick some questions. Uh, can we mute ourselves? Uh, we need, or uh, maybe. Can we mute ourselves, otherwise you won't hear me. Can you ask me that question on Friday? I can go through the notes. Um, it's not much to go through. And we can do an example. Um, we need to mute, somebody needs to mute themselves. Uh, anyway, I, I think someone is muting. Basically, ask me on Friday, uh, and then I'll explain. I'll explain it. I think you have a lecture, and I've got my MSC card. Very good thing. You know, that's in my Friday tutorial. What time is it? But by the way, by the way, this is the outline of the course that everybody has. Can some? Can the person mute themselves? <laughs> Great to mute yourself. Uh, what I wanted to show you is this uh, course outline. You're asking me which is the next subject. So you want to follow this because it follows what your, your quizzes are going to be. 
Now we've done all of these things. We've just done pressure and temperature. I normally do this under thermal properties and thermodynamics. But anyway, I'm sticking to this. The next thing is thermal properties of matter followed by thermodynamics one and two. And there's a lot of notes on this. I'll explain when we come to it. Um, so this is a slightly longer subject than the others. Right, so let me uh, stop recording. And then on...